Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Doctor's Corner. May what we say here today bring honor and glory and praise to you, Father. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father. Today we're going to talk about high blood pressure a little bit. But before we start into that, I'd like to review with you, if I may, a few of the things that we have learned before. Remember, we try to deal only with facts, not someone's theories, not someone's opinion who considers himself to be an expert, but really direct from the Word of God. And then we try to correlate that with the things that we have learned in the medical profession, because the Father is our nearest of kin, and he's been good enough to outline for us in his word those things that if we follow them, they will help us in our health. It actually has been the most meaningful, the most powerful, exciting thing that has occurred in health field in my discovery during my medical career. It's so simple that you won't believe it. The metabolism of fat causes most of our so-called degenerative diseases. The underlying cause of them then is hardening of the arteries. That atherosclerosis are the plaque formations on those blood vessels. 30,000 miles of them. And it doesn't only affect the heart, but all of the vital organs. We learned that in Leviticus 3.16 and 17, we were told very early, the principle was laid down that all of the fat belongs to the Lord and we should not eat fat or blood. We can't handle those concentrated materials and quantity without many, many waste products being given off that wind up causing us disease. And then in Leviticus 7 and 23, he told Moses, speaking to the children of Israel, that they should eat no manner of fat, whether it be of ox or of sheep or of goat. So even the clean animals, those that he created for us to eat, he doesn't want us to eat the fat. It should follow that the pressed oil from the vegetable fats as they were created to be eaten, also the vegetables, probably is not all right. We find that they aren't, and largely it's the heating process that we put them through and the concentration as we process them. Now, butter is okay in moderate quantities because, of course, butter has not been processed except by the cow. She doesn't overheat it never gets more than her body temperature. And as the buttermilk then is churned, for those of who you who have churned butter, and the butter becomes okay for us to eat. It can't, contains the good type of cholesterol that allows the building of brain tissue, the fibers that cover the nerve sheaths, and all of the cell membranes that cover them. But we notice also that our liver manufactures cholesterol, and it will manufacture all we need, even if we eat none. Just as animals have the ability to manufacture cholesterol from what they eat, the grass and the grains, we also have the ability to manufacture good cholesterol <clears throat> from what we eat. And the only way to make your cholesterol, the good cholesterol, the HDL, is not so much what you eat, although it is greatly influenced by what you eat, but even greater influenced by the exercise that you get. Exercise to energize. As we exercise, the blood cholesterol, the so-called HDL, the high-density lipoprotein goes up. The low-density lipoprotein 
goes down. So exercise will help. It's true that fish, which has a lot of the omega-3 factor, is very good and drives your HDL level up. As a matter of fact, fish is so good that if we eat it two or three times a week, it decreases our risk of a coronary artery attack, of a heart attack, by 50%. Now those are what I consider to be things that are heart-wise should be taken to heart for thought. Fish, then, should be your number one source of protein. It doesn't mean you shouldn't eat others. I don't ever want to leave the impression that you should be a purist. Eat all of God's creation in moderation. And as we eat, especially the green vegetables, we get that carotene. Carotene is a precursor of vitamin A. And the carotene is a big factor in avoiding cancer. Now, did I say it would avoid it, eat all the fat you want? Of course not. You can't do that and expect it to eliminate the hazards of fat. Only if you're eating very little fat will it be beneficial to you. So we learned then very early in God's Word the principle was laid down that fat is your number one health enemy. Secondly, he laid down the principle that the lack of exercise is your number two health enemy, and we should exercise. Of course, it's going to profit this flesh body only during this flesh age, <clears throat> not unto salvation. Don't make a religion out of the health food regulations and rules that our Father gave us so that you expect to be saved because you're oh so religious and do so meticulously all these things in the Mosaic Law. No, he only gave us those regulations that we could live during this flesh age of trial in health, just as he gave us that book of Ecclesiastes, that we might live in this flesh body in happiness. And as he wrote that book of Proverbs, to give us rules to live by, that we might be successful and live in peace of mind and wisdom. Our Father is so good to us, if we would only listen to his word, it will explain every aspect of our daily life, every ethic that we should follow. So not only is fat your number one health enemy then, Ex lack of exercise is your number two health enemy. And we also learned that coronary artery disease is caused by the ingestion of dietary fat and lack of exercise. Isn't that amazing? And our father told us all about it before we realized in the medical profession that it would do that. Now, yet we have now proven that they are true. We know God's word is true from the beginning. And really, it's our function, then, to be obedient. We also know that adult-acquired diabetes is caused by dietary fat. Well, I didn't know that. Well, we're going to talk about that a little later, more at length, part of a, another study. Cancer is preventable. And how real the link is between cancer and the food you eat is absolutely remarkable. It is so simple that you're not going to believe it. You're going to say, well, that couldn't be. Someone would have told me about that a long time ago. The world argues and staggers around blinded in darkness. Why don't you think tall above this confusion and just obey God's word in obedience. You may not totally understand it. None of us do. We can't reason it out. He's not precise. But all of his word is pertinent. He doesn't always say, well, this will cause you to get cancer or coronary artery disease. No, he just tells you not to eat it. Your job is obedience. If you eat it, you're going to get in trouble. The Bible is a book of prevention. 
Genesis to Revelation. It's a book of cause and effect, a book of blessings and curses. All of you are familiar with Deuteronomy 28. The same pattern is followed through. So we're not to just partake of a part of God's Word, partake of all of it. Now, of course, we can't memorize it, just so we know the pattern, what he expects of us. And if we try, he's going to be very happy with us. He's going to appreciate it. None of us are perfect, and he, we shouldn't try to be. Don't make a religion out of the health food laws. Don't become preoccupied with your health. Be preoccupied with the Word of God, and you're going to turn out all right. So this flesh age really isn't too important to us then because it's for such a short time when compared to eternity. As we discuss high blood pressure then, well, maybe we ought to say another word or two about cancer for those who haven't seen the program on cancer. We discovered that 50% of cancer deaths were caused by the ingestion of fat, probably more. We just haven't been able to prove them scientifically. That's interesting. You know, true science really is nothing more than a study of God's creation, and it never disagrees with God's Word. If it does, hey, we've somehow goofed. We either don't understand God's Word or we've made a mistake in our scientific calculation. So we should go back to the drawing board, both in studying our Father's Word and in our scientific endeavor. So we've discovered with blood pressure, one of every two adults, there's about 60 mi 120 million adults in this country and of those, about half of them, 60 million, have high blood pressure. So it's pretty prevalent. Every other adult. Now with coronary artery disease, we have so much of that that it's every other person, that many. Well, almost half a million are dying with cancer and quite a number dying with high blood pressure. And the beauty of it is it also is preventable. The unfortunate thing is that ivory tower medicine seems to tell us that salt is the no-no. Salt is the causative factor. Salt is of no influence in 85% of people. It influences high blood pressure in only 15%. Now, am I saying use all the salt you want, just dump it on there? Of course not. Most of us take in too much salt. We really have no need for salt. We need sodium. Sodium, salt is sodium chloride. We need the sodium that occurs naturally in the food that God has created, the fruits, the vegetables, and the grains. They contain all the sodium that we really need. And we will absorb that sodium very rapidly. Well, what about that 15%? Well, we can't tell without some checking, and you have to have your doctor monitor this. I'm certainly saying to you, at no time do we want to take the position of taking the place of your doctor. We want only to augment his work. If he works with nature, God is going to heal you. We're only trying to tell you the simple rules that God has laid down that all of us can follow. And we are the ones that have to prevent disease. As all of you know, I'm a retired physician and surgeon. I practiced for somewhat over 40 years. And during that time, God allowed me to see and to understand a great number of things. Those things that he allowed me to see and understand caused me to trust him completely for those things that I don't see and understand. And there are a lot of those things. I simply 
don't understand many things. Does this disturb me? Of course not. I'm very happy and praise him because he's given me eyes to see and ears to hear his word, to understand it. As we go forward then in this blood pressure, we have to think about what is the American diet? The average or standard American diet is certainly sad. We eat 40 to 50 percent of our calories on the average individual as fat. It really ought to be no more than about 10 percent if we have an illness and want nature to cure it, the body to cure itself. Now, I'm not belittling your doctor nor any of the technology that's come to the front. It's awesome. It's fantastic, the improvements that have been made. But we are drowning in information and starved for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We somehow get off track, like the American Heart Association. Now, the American Heart Association is a good organization, and it's made up of specialists that treat hearts. But they have advised that 30% of your calories is adequate. Cut it to 30%. Well, they've said if you cut it to 30% of your calories, people will abide by it. They will follow it. If you cut it to 10, they won't listen. Now, that's no excuse for not telling people what the ideal is. Once you've been told what the ideal is, once you allow those thoughts as to the proper food to flow over the taste buds of the thought buds of your mind, very similar to the way that honey flows over the taste buds of your tongue, you absorb it. It becomes your responsibility. Either you do it or you don't do it. If you don't do it, it's really not going to help you much to know about it, is it? Knowledge has to be applied to be of use. We tend not to apply God's health food laws, his word, to our health, and it's a mistake, and I'm here to try to bring this to your attention. It is my prayer that it will drive you deeper into God's word to see what other truths he has to release to you. Study God's word and understand it. So our standard diet then is 40 to 50 percent calories is fat. The American Diabetic Association, the American Heart Association recommend 30 percent. Do not expect any disease that you might have to become reversible with that quantity of fat. It won't. Can we reverse these diseases? Yes. Research has been done recently to indicate that even cancer is reversible at certain stages. Now. They have studied a particularly the they have studied particularly cancer of the breast. Yes, cancer of the breast has been found even after it's palpable <clears throat> to decrease in size, to respond better to treatment if you are placed on a super low-fat diet, even after you have the cancer. wonder why that is. We have to understand how cancer comes about. The macrophages, those large white cells, which it is their job to digest debris, to digest bacteria, yes, to digest even cancer cells, won't work if they're filled with fat. When you eat a big fatty meal, the fat gets into your bloodstream, the macrophages try to devour it and destroy it because it knows that they are not good for your health. The body working to save you from the problems that you are creating, those macrophages then, if you're not eating fat, become active and they can devour 
bacteria and cancer cells as they float through the body. And as a result then, people that are on an extremely low fat diet actually live longer even if they have cancer and are more comfortable on an extremely low fat diet, particularly if it involves vital organs. Like I had a lady who had cancer of the liver, metastatic, involving two-thirds of the liver to the point that she was jaundiced and unable to eat, had to be hospitalized for dehydration. Well, we found that when we placed her on a carbohydrate diet only, we knew we were never going to be able to cure her by surgery or any other method. She was going to die. But she was able to eat and live comfortably at home the rest of her life on a high carbohydrate diet. No protein, no fat at all. She ate scrambled eggs one day with a little sausage and got into trouble. And after that, she followed my directions to the letter. Well, <clears throat> medical school advice then to doctors generally is that you, if you have high blood pressure, place you on medicine, prescribe drugs for the rest of your life. Now, they prescribe what they call stepped up therapy. You're usually started on a diuretic most of you know that as a water pill. And if that brings your blood pressure down, that's all you have to take. But if it doesn't bring it down, then they keep the water pill going and add two, three, four, five, and sometimes as high as six to seven drugs in addition just to control your blood pressure. It's pretty awesome. First of all, the diuretics as you would guess the water pill dehydrates you, causes you to pass a lot of the water. So you need more water. With that, I better take a drink here because I guess I'm suggesting that I'm thirsty. <clears throat> what it really does, it actually increases the death rate from other causes. Isn't that terrible? Now, does it, cure does it cure high blood pressure? Of course it doesn't. It treats the symptoms. None of the high blood pressure medicines that we've come up with to date cures the pathology. What is the pathology? Atherosclerosis, that hardening of the arteries, the narrowing of the blood vessel that supplies the kidneys. That causes the high blood pressure. We can only reverse that, and yes, it is reversible, and it's been proven to be reversible on many, many occasions by altering our lifestyle system to the proper food, which contains no fat, high carbohydrate, exercise, and no smoking. So then, what shall we say about this matter of high blood pressure? If we take drugs we've noticed there are a lot of complications. They relieve symptoms, all right, but they decrease the blood flow and they dilate the blood vessels. There are many side effects. Actually, as I've told you, death with the diuretics. As the blood flow decreases, the kidney function decreases. Drugs cause prescribed drugs, 20% of kidney failures. And blood pressure medicine, drugs, is at the very top of the list. Capsules, health simply doesn't come in capsules. You can't poison yourself into health with drugs called medicine. It will not occur. If you want to cure it, go on the no-fat regime, the high-carbohydrate regime, and the no-fat regime. So our, our need for salt then isn't great, as I told you. We get all the sodium we need in the food. It's all right to use a little salt 
it's okay to use salt substitute. Now, some of the people that are so intelligent that they're mightier than thou and don't really have any common sense at all tell no one to eat any salt and don't use any salt substitutes. Well, that's foolishness. We have found that potassium used in no salt, the product called no salt, is potassium chloride. And actually, it decreases the number of strokes in individuals to bring their potassium up. If we eat that modestly, hey, but food tastes fine without it. You don't have to have it. But there's nothing wrong with salt for most people. So what are the other complications? The kidneys and many other vital organs simply don't get enough nutrient, enough of the nutrients are enough oxygen with this decreased blood flow. Fifty percent of men that are on this blood pressure medicine become impotent in two years of medication. Well, how about obesity? Yes, that's very bad. Men develop high blood pressure when they've been obese for about eight years. With women, it's about 14 years. They again have built in kind of a factor that protects them in their hormonal level. We don't understand it completely, but it does occur. So kidney failures then, 20% of them are simply caused by medicines. What about the results without drugs? Do you want to get results without drugs? Would you like to cure your high blood pressure? Now, I don't want you to do this on your own. Have your doctor monitor it. But put yourself, if you have high blood pressure and you really want to get off of it, for four to eight weeks or until you get results. 85% of you will get results within that eight-week eight period. And if during that eight weeks you eat no meat, eggs, cheese, butter, and milk. Now, I've told you, have I told you to go off of them completely? Not permanently, just for a short period of time. Eat nothing but fruits, vegetables, and grains. All the whole grain bread you need, and I remember, it's good to bake your bread if you're fixing at home out of whole grains, and of course, use olive oil in your baking. Eat all the bread you want. Eat all the fruits you want, all the vegetables you want. An experiment was, ran, was run on a large number of adults, and all they did was decrease the fat to 10% of your calories. Now, that's no visible fat. All fat trimmed, and actually to get it down to 10, you've got to cut out the meats and so on because you get a certain amount of fat in your vegetables and accidentally. No one have I ever seen that had a fat depri depriving of fat, some disease that developed from this. Now, we get more than we need accidentally. Now, am I saying fat is entirely bad that you put on your system? Of course not. It insulates the body. It cushions the vital organs. We have some 40 billion fat cells. But the fat that we ingest in the digestion of it, we get into these troubles. Well, not only fruits and vegetables and grains, till you get results. Four to eight weeks, about 85% of you will be off of it. But you ought to check your blood pressure during this period twice daily and decrease the medicine very slowly. With medical advice, have your doctor monitor you is he's going to be surprised at the results you'll get. Remember, if you reduce it to 10%, in 10 days it drops 10%. Only 10% of your calories is fat. It will drop. Well, what about if it's 30%? It won't drop. It won't do any good at all. If you want to prevent it by eating 30% of your calories as fat, forget it. Go about your business. So the best treatment then is nutrition with your doctor as your monitor. Now, one of the last times I talked with you, I asked you to please develop a chart for yourself. 
with the things you could eat more of on the right-hand side and the things you ought to eat less of on the left-hand side. Don't try to fix a menu to begin with. Just start putting down those real fatty items such as donuts and so on that you shouldn't eat, at least not much of, preferably none of. On the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, put down things that you can eat all you want of, like all of the fruits and vegetables that you like, the beans, the grains, the rice, the corn, all vegetables, oatmeal, and fish, and go ahead and complete that list, and then abide by it. You know, you have to be a doer of the word, or it's not going to help you. As to these side effects, then, they're easily avoided. Just gradually discontinue your medicines. They're going to show you some charts. Will be guidelines for your healthy heart foods, mainly to cut out the fat. Now, this is just given to you as an example. I want you to develop your own chart. Why? I want you to become responsible for your health. Don't say, Doc Alexander said I could eat this or that. Check it out. What foods do you really like? And go with it. Well, what about drugs? Over four and a half million people are admitted to the hospital annually simply because they have problems with drugs that have been prescribed for them. <clears throat> and over 60% of the hospital consultation, doctor to doctor, occurs with drug interactions and drug reactions. We find that we're allergic to a great number of drugs, and we are apt to get into trouble with those and particularly the combination of drugs. I've already warned you that 20% of the kidney failures, now this is serious, when the kidney fails, hey, you're in bad trouble. 20% of them are caused by drugs that we take. I hesitate to tell you, but in the average hospital, the wrong medicine, the wrong prescribed medicine is given daily. A mistake is made. Why? Hey, we're human. We all make mistakes. And the personnel does. Frequently when you're hospitalized, you hear of a so-called nosocomial infection. All that really means is it's an infection you acquired in the hospital. And usually it's very difficult to get rid of because it ordinarily has already been exposed to treatment with antibiotics. It has become resistant. The new generation strain of bacteria. And the more resistant it becomes, the more of new drugs that, and the more drugs that they have to give you in order to treat this particular disease. So what am I asking you to do? Think always of the cause, the prevention, and the cure of disease. Don't make the cure worse than the disease itself. Think tall above the confusion of the world. Let them stumble around in the dark if they must. Have your doctor monitor your progress. Well, I understood that with high blood pressure, a lot of people got these strokes. Well, they do. And there are several different types of strokes. We're not going into them in great detail, but since they're related to high blood pressure, now is the time to talk about it a little bit. There's the cerebral bleed, and it causes paralysis. There's cerebral embolisms. They cause paralysis. It's just a blood clot that shake loose, shakes loose, usually in the wall of the heart or in one of the veins of the legs, and goes to your brain. Usually the paralysis is temporary, and we get over those. 
or they may be caused by what we call arterial stricture. This arterial stricture or closing then will cause paralysis, which is a very serious complication of high blood pressure. What would be my best advice then on high blood pressure? Actually, with high blood pressure, you should be on a very low-fat diet. Keep your weight down. Remember, women get obese. We men get fat. So if you're fat and you're a man for eight years, your blood pressure comes up. With women who become obese, it's about 14 years. And once you have it, it's very difficult to get rid of. You've got to really toe the mark in order to get a cure. Well, we certainly should have a high fiber diet. We've learned that before. Fat may be, be the villain, but fiber is the hero, certainly in cancer of the colon, also the hero in high blood pressure. It removes, helps you to remove the toxins from the body as it speeds the, the travel of the stool through the alimentary tract. You don't have as long to absorb the cholesterol and the fat. Eat all the high carbohydrate, that is starches, that you want. Potatoes and such things. Don't put sour cream or that sort of thing on them unless you realize that you're doing it and that you're getting fat. A modest quantity, if you're healthy, is not going to bother you. But don't make a glutton of yourself. Very little protein. Hey, we just wear out our little bit of our muscle on a daily basis. Four ounces of lean meat is adequate. Our fish, or whatever you choose to eat chicken. Control your weight. No smoking. Lower your blood cholesterol rather quickly. If you want to do a cholesterol fade out real quickly, drop it to a normal level, take yourself off of all meat, eggs, cheese, butter, and milk for a period of five to six weeks. Now, I did this several years ago experimenting on myself. I did a number of studies to determine what would be best for my patients. And I was a pretty big meat eater. I grew up on a farm and we didn't think you'd be been fed unless you had meat three times a day. So I cut myself completely off of meat. And I always had eggs for breakfast with my meat. I sh shut off the eggs. And I drank milk, and I eat ice cream. I did all the things that we shouldn't be doing. But when I discontinued them for a six-week period completely, didn't eat any of them, I found out I wasn't going to starve, that I still had a high energy level, that I really felt better, that I was losing weight. And so I went back on them in modest quantities then, and have continued on modest quantities permanently. That's the reason I don't want you ever to diet. If you go on a diet, it would seem that what you have done, you plan to get off of. I want you to go on a regime that you're going to stay on the rest of your life. Eliminate the fat permanently, and then you will get health permanently and hopefully will only die of old age. Let's talk a little bit about adult acquired diabetes. Now, not infantile diabetes, but adult acquired diabetes. The co well, maybe before I do that, I'll just say another word about cancer killers. The number one killer in men is cancer of the lung. The number two killer is cancer of the colon. The number three killer is cancer of the prostate. And then number four, the urinary tract. In women, cancer of the breast is the number one killer. Lung rates second. Colon third. 
and uterus fourth. Unfortunately, of wh white males are decreasing their smoking, but white females are increasing their smoking, as you would expect from these statistics. Their ingestion of fat seems to be about similar. So with that in mind then, and the fact that we can prevent 80% of these cancer deaths, you have your work cut out for you. Finish that chart. The fat stuff on the left, the stuff you can eat all of on the right. As we discuss diabetes, it too is preventable. And by removing dietary fat, we can, pre we can actually prevent 80% of diabetes by the proper diet exercise. Now, diabetes is a disease that's been around a long time. The Egyptians had it. Remember our Father's promises to us that you will have none of the evil diseases of the Egyptians? Well, none of the evil diseases, I want to remind you, they had all of the diseases that we have today, although not quite as many. We have more of them. For instance, diabetes was one of those diseases that only royalty could afford, enough of the rich food to cause it. Now we can afford it in America for almost everyone. They knew how to cure it then. They banished this royalty that developed diabetes to the peasantry. And all they got to eat were fruits, veg, fruit, vegetables, and grains, and their diabetes cleared up. They didn't get any fat, and they worked them hard every day. So exercise is extremely important. Somewhere on the line, we got confused. You notice we call it in the slang sugar diabetes. What does this mean? Well, about 300 years ago, an Englishman discovered sugar in the urine of diabetics and decided it was sugar that caused diabetes. It really isn't. It's true that the glucose tolerance is the important part of the disease. The ability to digest sugars are glucose. However, actually, if we cut out the fat, the diabetic regains the ability for the insulin to work. Yes, over 90% of diabetics have three or four times as much insulin as they need. It has been rendered inactive, unable to function because of fat. Fat that is absorbed and causes those cells, those insulin, that insulin, not to function. So if we want our insulin or our glucose tolerance to increase, we must exercise on a daily basis. We find after three or four days at the most, usually three days, the good effect of exercise begins to dwindle. So it behooves us to exercise daily if we want to be relieved of this diabetic condition. So then, what are we saying? Since we got off on the wrong track, let's get back on the right track. A young man over at the University of Kentucky has proven if you cut your diabetes, I'm sorry, if you cut your fat intake, to no more than 10% of your calories, your diabetes goes away. Now, by, diabetes is not too hard to cure. We can actually cure you of diabetes even if you have to take insulin within three to five weeks if you remove the fat from your diet. Well, all I eat is a couple of donuts in the morning with my coffee well, that won't do it, will it? They're loaded with fat. 
You need to make a list of all the things like Danish rolls and donuts and so on that may have hidden fat, that does have hidden fat. Put those on your no-no list. How bad is this disease, diabetes? Well, there are about 10 million plus diabetics. Over half of them are not diagnosed in this country. That's sort of bad, isn't it? We find that 70% of these people are, ob are obese, if we want to be polite. If we don't, we can just say they're fat. Actually, coronary artery disease occurs three times as often, death from coronary artery disease, three times as often in diabetics, take a thousand of them and a thousand non-diabetics, they develop three times as much coronary artery disease. They account for 80% of the gangrenous legs that are removed. Diabetics. 17% of the new blindness occurs in diabetics. But over 90% of them have three or four times as much insulin as they need. As the fat enters the bloodstream, the platelets become sensitive and insensitive. They can't burn simple sugars. Does that mean we should remove carbohydrate, those starches, those complex carbohydrates from our diet? No. Conventional wisdom frequently says yes, but if you exercise and continue to eat complex carbohydrates, avoiding simple sugars completely, you do well. Now, you can't eat all the fruit that you would like to have <clears throat> because fruit is actually a complex carbohydrate that has a lot <clears throat> of sugar in it. It's mostly complex carbohydrate. Not that there's anything wrong with complex carbohydrates. However, diabetics can't metabolize large quantities of them. Probably you have to hold your fruit intake to about three helpings of fruit a day. Now, does that mean peaches and syrup? Of course not. I'm talking of frozen fruits, fresh fruits, or diabetic packed fruits that are canned. Well, I always heard that adult acquired diabetic was hereditary. Well, you heard wrong. Actually, when I was in medical school, they taught us that it was hereditary. But there's a fellow in England who studied 300 sets of twins, and some of them have had adult acquired diabetes and another one has gone for 30 years without it and still doesn't have it. So it's not hereditary. I'm talking about identical twins from the same ovum, ovum splitting off. So they are identical personages then as far as we can ascertain. What are the proper foods then and the proper exercise? Well, again, only about three miles a day will be adequate. And the proper food we've already outlined for you. Diabetes is on the increase. What about chromalin? Well, chromalin is very good. Its primary role is to maintain glucose tolerance, to, to develop that ability for the body to digest these complex carbohydrates, and yes, even simple sugars. And it also brings your cholesterol down a little bit, chromalin does. So if you're diabetic, you certainly ought to go on Brewer's yeast, which has a lot of chromalin in it. Is that going to cure you? No, it's not. Do drugs cure you? No, they don't. They relieve the symptoms, but they do not cure diabetes. Well, how difficult it is to get it. I can cause you to do, be diabetic in two weeks if you eat what I tell you. Well, I'm not going to tell you because it's the wrong things. What about drugs being used to treat diabetics who have heart conditions? 
It's a very sad commentary. 250% more deaths in diabetics who are treated for their diabetes with drugs rather than with nutrition. 250%. Yet, 85% of cardiologists, these are heart specialists, continue to treat their diabetics with drugs. You can cure 85% of them, even those that are on insulin. Certainly 65% of those that are on insulin, at least 85% of the rest, with nothing but diet and exercise. Well, it's true that many of the patients would rather not take the nutritional approach to relieving their illness. Does that give us any excuse to treat them improperly when 250% more of them die that have heart disease if you treat them with drugs for their insulin? Drugs then simply are not the answer. We should focus on the quality of our foods. Regardless of what the American Diabetic Association or the American Heart Association has to say about the matter, they simply have not taken enough fat out of the diet to do any good. Your diabetes is not going to weigh to go away, you'll have to be treated with drugs the rest of your life if you follow that method. Well, now, a lot of people have said to me, gee, I don't think cheese has much fat in it. Here you say it has 60 or 70 percent of its calories as fat. A little simple experiment that you can run is take a piece of a paper towel and lay a chunk of cheese on it, slice if you want to, and set it out in the sun, in the hot sun at about noontime on a summer day, and leave it out there a couple of hours and bring it in. See how much fat has been bled out of it. It ought to impress you with the importance. Are we victims then of coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, gallbladder disease, or are we bringing it on ourselves? We bring it on ourselves by what we eat. Well, I thought that uh, my Uncle George had this, and I was going to get it too. Your Uncle George had the same bad habits that you have developed and allowed to contend. Discipline yourself. Avoid fat. It is your number one health enemy. Lack of exercise is your number two health enemy. As we go forward then, have we developed a life pattern that brings on these degenerative diseases? A life pattern of inactivity? Many of us have jobs that don't require a lot of physical exertion. And as a result, we don't get the exercise that we need. What should we do about these things? First of all, avoid foods that are high in fat. You make a list of them. I'm going to give you a few hints as we go along here. What about Danish pastries and donuts and cookies and pies and cakes and thick gravies and even dressing? Well, that's a few to start with. Actually, it's your responsibility to develop from something that you feel you want to live with permanently, not a diet, to be gone off of after you've lost a little weight. Hey, that may cause you problems losing weight if you don't do it properly. Certainly, if you go on one of these high protein diets to lose weight, it causes atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, kills many people, it's criminal to put them on it. We had our present state of knowledge in the medical profession. Yet, it's a favorite way to lose weight. You'll lose weight very rapidly. So, let's conclude by realizing that diabetes is preventable, it's curable, 
we know the cause. Let's do something about it. You individually, if you have the diabetes, one word, let the word of God be your food for thought. Keep a clear eye on Christ. He is the great physician. He will heal you. Thank you and God bless you.